yet. All right, so um, thanks for having me. I'm going to talk today about uh, next generation cosmology and astrophysics with the foreground cleaned microwave background. Um, and a lot of this work is driven by uh, these two experiments, the Atacama Cosmology Telescope um, and the Simons Observatory, which I'll tell you about in some detail. OK, so where do we stand with the CMB? Um, this has obviously been a tremendously successful area of, of cosmology and astrophysics for a couple of decades or more. At this point, we have these very nice full sky maps of the CMB temperature and isotropy as measured by Planck. We also have higher sensitivity maps on smaller regions of sky measured from the ground, uh, some of which I'll show you. Uh, there are tens of millions of pixels in this map, which itself is constructed from uh, several um, sky maps made by Planck at different frequencies. And the statistical properties of this map are fully described by a simple model with just six parameters. So what have we learned uh, from this type of analysis? We've constrained the background cosmological parameters, like the matter density, the baryon density, the age of the universe, and a spatial curvature at high precision. We've also learned a lot about the properties of the initial fluctuations that provided the seeds of all structure in the universe. We know that they're drawn from a nearly scale invariant distribution, though not exactly scale invariant. We know that they're drawn from a distribution that's consistent with Gaussianity. They're adiabatic in the sense that all of the components um, and the energy density fluctuated in the same way. And there are super horizon correlations uh, in these fluctuations, which we can infer directly from the CMB. All right, given this tremendous progress, what questions remain? Uh, fortunately, there's a lot of really exciting things to do. So first of all, we'd like to probe how structure has grown over the history of the universe. This is related to the properties of neutrinos, dark energy, and potential modifications of gravity. With the CMB, we can probe this using measurements of the gravitational lensing of the CMB, as well as the thermal and kinematic cnabs aldovich effects, which I'll talk about uh, in just a minute. Secondly, we'd like to learn how galaxies formed um, in high precision. And this is intimately linked to the question of where uh, the baryons are located in the late time universe, um, as well as what their thermodynamic properties are. And we think that um, this is really governed by uh, the idea of astrophysical feedback processes. And I'll spend a lot of the talk talking about um, how we can probe these uh, with uh, the SZ effects. And then the other big question, uh, which Gashar alluded to, is the question of what seeded the initial fluctuations uh, that gave our cell structure in the universe. Uh, we think inflation was responsible. Um, we still haven't seen the signature of primordial gravitational waves, but um, the facilities that I'll talk about um, will really yield transformative constraints in this area by looking for um, the primordial B-mode polarization in the CMB. Um, I'm not going to talk too much about this question today, though. All right, so for the purposes of most of this talk, uh, you should think of the CMB not so much as a background, but rather as a backlight that's illuminating all the structure in the universe between us and the surface of last scattering. So in this sort of uh, schematic diagram, we're over here on the right, the present day. The surface of last scattering is over here on the left, the redshift 1100, a few hundred thousand years after the Big Bang. Uh, as CMB photons traverse the universe, a number of interesting things can happen to them. Um, and these go under the name of the secondary anisotropies in the CMB. So first, let me talk about scattering processes. Uh, these are the thermal and kinematic Sunaid-Zeldovich effects. Um, the one neat property of these effects is that they are redshift independent uh, because they're scattering rather than emission processes, uh, which is a pretty unique property in observational astrophysics. So first, the kinematic SZ effect. So this just refers to the Doppler boosting of CMB photons as they compton and scatter off of free electrons that are moving with some non-zero line of sight velocity. So imagine we have these clouds of ionized gas, for example, in galaxy clusters or in galaxies that are falling towards each other, and these have some component of the velocity along the line of sight. Uh, this would tend to upscatter this photon uh, and downscatter this photon. So this probes the integrated electron momentum along the line of sight. So some important facts about this effect are that it preserves the black body spectrum of the CMB. That's because it's basically just a boost transformation between frames, uh, so it doesn't distort the actual black body spectrum. Uh, it's a probe of the electron momentum field, so the temperature fluctuations induced by the KSZ effect are given by this particular line of sight integral, where the important quantity here is this uh, PE, which is the electron momentum field. Now, this is a product of the electron density um, and the electron velocity. The velocity that enters here are really large-scale linear theory velocities. So we can use this as a probe, um, essentially, of the small-scale electron distribution directly. So it's a very precise tool, um, for example, to locate the so-called missing baryons, or really, more precisely, to probe the distribution of baryons on small scales. All right, then we have the thermal SZ effect. Um, this is the change in temperature of CMB photons as the inverse Compton scatter off of some hot electrons. 
Um, most of these are found in the intercluster medium of galaxy clusters, where the potential wells are so deep uh, that the virial temperature of the gas of the electrons is very high. Um, this uh, distorts the spectrum um, of the CMB, unlike the uh, KOZ effect, as I'll, as I'll show you in a second. Uh, this is given by this particular line of sight integral of the electron pressure. So the K is Z is probing the integrated electron momentum. The T is Z probes the integrated electron pressure. Um, that's characterized by this dimensionless combination called the Compton Y parameter. Um, as I mentioned, this distorts the black body spectrum of the CMB. Um, so if you start with some initial black body distribution here, as it gets processed through this uh, cloud of hot electrons, the photons tend to get uh, upscattered to higher energies which produces a decrement in the CMB intensity at low frequencies and an increment at high frequencies with this null at around 217 or 218 gigahertz. So this is a nice um, picture of what this looks like. So this is simulated data um, of what a massive galaxy cluster looks like in the Planck channels. So I'll play this again. You see this decrement at low frequencies and then this null at 217 gigahertz and then this increment at higher frequencies. And later I'll show you um, a real galaxy cluster where you can see this by eye as well. All right, let me now talk about um, deflection processes in the secondary anisotropies. So this refers to gravitational lensing of the CMB. Um, one neat thing about gravitational lensing of this particular uh, source is that the CMB is the most distant light source possible in the universe. So gravitational lensing basically just remaps the fluctuations in the CMB. Uh, it preserves the black body form spectrally. Basically, just have some CMB photon propagating and encounters some massive structure, and that slightly deflects the path of the photon. So, we can write this um, here as the lens CMB, just as some remapping of the unlensed CMB under this uh, deflection field D. Um, so, you might ask, how could we actually measure this field D given that we can't access the unlensed CMB? Uh, the way you do this, basically, just note that this is a small number, perform a Taylor expansion of the right hand side of this equation. And then if you look at the two-point correlation function now, you'll see that there's a term which is proportional to this deflection field D. So you can essentially just invert this then and solve for that deflection field or for the lensing potential of which the deflection is just the gradient. And this is the so-called quadratic estimator for CMB lensing. So with quadratic pairs of temperature uh, fields or polarization fields, we can infer maps of this lensing potential. Um, one neat thing about CMB lensing is that it's sensitive to high redshift structures. So here I'm showing the, the lensing kernel for the CMB. Um, so this has a peak at around redshift 2, but extends all the way up to, in principle, redshift 1100. Although, of course, structure hasn't grown too much um, until later times. In contrast, if you look at the lensing of galaxies, that's sensitive to structure at much lower redshifts. So for a typical distribution of LSST source galaxies, uh, the LSST lensing kernel itself peaks below redshift 0.5. So for things at higher redshifts, really above redshift 1, CMB lensing is really the best way to probe uh, the matter distribution. So here are some pictures of what this looks like. This is a small patch of unlensed CMB. This is a simulation. Um, this is three and a half degrees on a side. Here's what it looks like without lensing. Once you apply lensing, you see this small warping effect. Um, basically, degree scale blobs of the CMB are just getting shifted around by a couple of arc minutes. Um, since it's a simulation, I can also show you the matter distribution directly. Uh, this is the lensing potential that was used. And indeed, you can see where most of the warping happens is where most of the matter is located. This particular map um, is from a suite of uh, supercomputer-based n-body simulations that we ran uh, a few years ago, led by Jia Liu, a PhD student who I was uh, supervising at Columbia. Um, and then just to give you a sense of how well we can actually measure this with data, this is an example of uh, a reconstruction of the lensing field in that case um, for a Simons Observatory-like data set using just the temperature-based uh, reconstruction. So polarization would also help here, but um, you can see pretty strong correlations just by eye, which is pretty neat. All right, so then the last couple of secondary anisotropy effects that I won't discuss in much detail are related to the evolution of gravitational potentials. These go under the name of the integrated sachs wolf and reese yama effects, um, but I'm not going to cover these in much detail today. So how do we actually measure these signals? The thermal SZ effect we can reconstruct using its uh, spectral information, as I'll show you in a minute. Gravitational lensing, we can measure with this quadratic estimator. And then things like KSZ, we have to infer through cross correlations. All right, so we have these three probes. The TSZ gives us a measurement of the electron pressure. The CMB lensing field gives us a measurement of the total mass along the line of sight. And the KSZ signal gives us a probe of the integrated electron momentum along the line of sight. 
I've worked on various aspects of all these signals, including cross correlations between them and ways that they can uh, bias one another. Uh, today, I'm just going to cover um, a few aspects of, of ongoing and recent work. So the big questions, again, here are how did structure grow in the universe, how did galaxies form, um, and where are baryons located in the late time universe, and what are their properties? All right, so what are the data sets that uh, we're going to use to answer these questions? So first, uh, we have the Advanced Atacama Cosmology Telescope. So this is located on Cerro Toco in the Atacama Desert in Chile. Uh, we build experiments there because the sky looks like this. So it's really easy to do CMB work. Um, this is a wide area survey um, covering almost 20,000 square degrees now, about half the sky, um, with uh, multi-frequency coverage. So we've observed at these three frequencies already um, for a few years, and we were putting a, a low frequency receiver on the telescope soon to give us more leverage over foregrounds um, and the extraction of some of these frequency dependent signals. Um, we recently have also um, obtained an extension uh, for this survey to 2021, um, around the time that SO will start. So CCA, of course, has been involved um, in advanced act uh, for a while, um, and this is something that I'd very much like to build on. Um, I should note that I'm currently co-leading all joint analyses between ACT and the Dark Energy Survey, uh, which is highly relevant to a lot of these uh, SZ cross correlations that I'll discuss in a minute. All right, the next big project that's happening in uh, ground-based CMB after ACT uh, is called the Simons Observatory, which you've likely all heard about here. Um, this is a combination of the ACT and Simons Array teams, although it's really grown beyond that now to a team of about 200 people. Um, ESO is a set of telescopes, not just one telescope. So first up, we have the Large Aperture Telescope, which you see a rendering of here. Uh, this is a six meter primary dish, about the same size as ACT, uh, but, but with a much larger cryostat that can hold up to 13 optics tubes that each contain uh, several uh, detector arrays. Um, the baseline frequency coverage is shown here, uh, spanning six channels from 30 to 270 gigahertz. Um, my work essentially was used to determine uh, this frequency distribution by optimizing for various uh, signals in the presence of uh, foreground contamination. We then have a set of small aperture telescopes um, shown here. Uh, these are specifically optimized to go after the primordial B-mode signal, which I'm not going to talk about uh, today, but we do expect to do extremely well um, with these facilities um, in probing the tensor to scalar ratio. Uh, I want to emphasize that SO is happening very quickly. So we expect to be taking scientific data in 2021. Um, it's 2019 now, so that's pretty soon. We're actually building these uh, telescopes right now. Uh, we have $80 million of funding that's fully in place, predominantly from the Simons Foundation. So this is really exciting. Um, I've personally been involved uh, since the inception of the experiment. I'm currently the leader of the foreground analysis working group, as well as a member of several of the other working groups. Um, and I'm also a member of the senior theory and analysis committee, uh, which is coordinating all the scientific analysis uh, for the experiment. So we're a large collaboration. We have about 200 people right now. Uh, CCA, of course, is deeply involved, and I would like to bring it even more uh, deeply um, into, the, uh, into the fold. This is a picture of uh, our group at the last collaboration meeting last summer. Um, so it's, it's been a lot of fun, and I'm really looking forward to, uh, to seeing where we can take this. Uh, I just want to mention quickly that there is plans for an even further future uh, ground-based experimental program. This goes under the name of CMBS4. Uh, which is being proposed to the Decadal uh, Survey right now. I'm involved particularly uh, through the uh, Galaxy Formation Analysis Working Group. Um, so if you're interested in uh, joining up with work on that, please talk to me. Our next uh, meeting is at Fermilab uh, in March. But predominantly today, I'm going to focus on SO. So let me give you an overview um, of our science goals uh, and some of the probes that we're going to use uh, to attack these. And then I'll zoom in and focus on just uh, a couple of particular ones for the rest of the talk. So again, we have this schematic of the history of the universe here. Um, the CMB is great because you can use it as a tool really to probe different aspects of physics and astrophysics over this entire range. So we can probe the properties of the primordial fluctuations um, by looking for CMB B-mode polarization, as well as properties like non-Gaussianity and the shape of the primordial power spectrum. We can look for the signatures of additional light relativistic species beyond the three known neutrinos through their contributions to the power spectrum. At later times, we can probe the properties of reionization, particularly through the KSZ effect. So these uh, ionized bubbles, as they percolate, generate a KSZ signal, just like uh, galaxies and clusters do at later times. We can probe the properties of neutrinos 
Um, I'll discuss this in some detail later, uh, particularly through measurements of CMB lensing. We can learn a lot about galaxy formation and evolution um, through the SZ effects, and I'll spend much of the rest of the talk telling you about this topic. And then lastly, we can also probe the properties of dark energy through CMB lensing and the counts of uh, SZ clusters. There's also a huge range of additional science. If you're interested in any of this, take a look at this uh, lengthy paper that we put out in August. Uh, my own contributions to the paper really span this entire range, um, uh, particularly through uh, producing foreground cleaned noise curves that underlaid uh, the forecast for essentially all these observables. So today I'm going to focus really on these two topics. Uh, first, let me turn to galaxy formation, and then I'll tell you um, about neutrino masses. All right, so how can we do galaxy formation with the CMB? Let me give you um, the context first about what we actually want to measure here. So the big question in galaxy formation, I think, is why star formation is so inefficient. So less than 10% of the available baryons are turned into stars. Uh, if you just ran a simulation with no feedback processes, you would get a much higher efficiency than this, as people found out um, a couple of decades ago. So the question is, why is this happening? Um, and the answer that we have really um, is feedback processes. So this refers to any process that can inject energy um, into the gas, heat it up, drive it out of halos, and thereby arrest star formation. So this can be feedback from supernova explosions, the accretion of matter onto supermassive black holes, cosmic rays, um, and all sorts of things. At the high mass end, we do think that uh, feedback from black holes um, is really the dominant process. So after many decades of work, current models generally agree with the stellar properties of galaxies. Um, this is a headline example from the Illustrious collaboration a couple of years ago, where they showed that they could produce synthetic images of the optical properties of galaxies that are basically indistinguishable from the Hubble Ultra Deep Field. So I would argue that the really key observational frontier in the subject is probing the gas properties, which again are where 90% of the baryons are, and this is where the CMB comes in. So why would you study feedback with uh, the thermal and kinematic SZ effects? Um, people often think about x-rays when they're thinking about probing hot gas. So this is just a cartoon that basically compares the sensitivity of different probes to the gas properties roughly near the real radius of halos. So at the high mass end, and particularly at low red shifts, x-rays are quite good. Um, unfortunately, as you go to higher red shifts, x-rays suffer from surface brightness dimming, um, and moreover, the signal goes like density squared, so it's very much peaked towards uh, the center of halos. Um, at lower masses and lower red shifts, absorption line spectroscopy has been very useful. Uh, this probes cool photoionized gas, uh, for example, using things like magnesium-2 absorption lines. Um, this is limited really by the statistics of the number of closed pairs that one can get. Uh, you need to have a, a background quasar, for example, uh, that is aligned with some foreground galaxy to let you do this type of work. In contrast, uh, the SZ effects really, uh, because of their redshift independent nature, can be probed across this entire redshift range. Um, and moreover, because they go like density rather than density squared, we can really probe gas well out to the real radius and beyond, as I'll show you. So I think that uh, there's strong complementarity here, um, as well as a, a unique range uh, that the SZ signals can probe uh, that these other uh, signals cannot. So let me give you um, an idea of what these uh, signals look like. So this is a slice through a hydrodynamical simulation that was run uh, by Nick Vitalia several, several years ago. Um, we're looking at the Compton Y field here, so the thermal SZ field. And this is uh, the whole simulation box uh, that he ran. This was the default model that had AGN feedback, as well as a number of different uh, hydrodynamical processes implemented, things like radiative cooling and star formation. Now let's look at the same simulation, but with AGN feedback turned off. So everything else is left on, but AGN feedback is turned off. So what you see is that when you turn on the AGN feedback, there's a lot more gas in the outskirts of the halos. Um, that's kind of visible by eye. And then if you take a difference map of the two, you can also see that in the inner regions of halos, there's actually a deficit of gas. That's these blue spots that you can see in the insides of the halos. And that's because you've essentially evacuated the gas from the halos. So this is the kind of thing that we're trying to probe with the TSZ signal. Um, so let me show you actually how we do this with data. So we can build large scale maps of the TSZ signal by combining multi-frequency CMB data sets. One can also do dedicated studies on individual objects, but I'm gonna focus on this statistical approach today. So for example, this is um, a set of seven of the maps uh, measured by Planck from 30 to 353 gigahertz. One can then synthesize these using the known frequency dependence of the TSZ effect in a way that uh, preserves that signal and minimizes other sources of noise and contamination. 
and derive a so-called internal linear combination map. So this is an old one uh, that I produced several years ago from the first Planck data release, uh, but this was the first publicly released uh, Compton Y map from Planck data. Um, and this is the fun little animation that I made back then that shows what the Coma cluster looks like at uh, several of the Planck frequencies. So you can see the decrement at low frequencies, null at 217, and then increment at higher frequencies. So this is just kind of neat. This uh, more recent update uh, comes from the Planck collaboration. This is their Compton mind map produced uh, from the full mission data set in uh, 2015. This is the Northern Galactic Hemisphere and the Southern Galactic Hemisphere. So the Como cluster is, uh, is right there. I want to emphasize that this is uh, a pretty low resolution map by the standards of um, galaxy formation studies, so it has a resolution of 10 arc minutes, uh, which is really well outside uh, the, the scale of any, of any halo except for very nearby, very massive galaxy clusters. So a key uh, frontier here is pushing this to higher resolution. Um, I've recently been working on novel methods for component separation. Uh, I'm not going to go into detail on this because it's mostly, I think, of technical interest, but I have a new uh, pipeline that I call MC squared ILC. If you're interested in learning how it works, please talk to me afterwards. Uh, but it's meant to be very flexible in allowing so-called deep projection of different types of contaminants whose SEDs one um, knows something about beforehand. So uh, I'm hopefully going to be releasing new maps from this pipeline publicly um, in the very near future. I do want to go into some detail, though, um, on work that we're doing right now. Um, doing the first joint combination of ACT and Planck data to make a TSZ map. Uh, this is work in progress with Matthew Matabachrol and Sigurd Ness. Um, we've developed a new method that we call TILC. So one of the funnest parts here is coming up with great acronyms, all these codes. Um, I'm not going to tell you what this stands for, but uh, you can ask me about that afterwards. Um, we have to develop a new method, though, because the noise properties of these ground-based data sets are quite different than the satellite uh, data. So here's an example of what uh, this map looks like. This is preliminary. There's still some artifacts from point source contamination. Uh, but this covers about 700 uh, square degrees, or about almost 10 times higher resolution than the Planck map. So this is a big step forward. Let me zoom in just on one a nice looking region. So you can actually see galaxy clusters here by eye. So all the red spots, sort of red over densities, in this map are actual galaxy groups and clusters. This is ABLE 119, a low redshift cluster, which in the ACT data alone is essentially lost to our atmospheric noise. Uh, but by doing this hybrid combination with Planck, we can recover both these nearby objects on large angular scales, as well as more distant clusters on smaller angular scales. Um, Suffice to say that there are really immense cross-correlation possibilities uh, with this map uh, and the other ones that we plan to make with the Dark Energy Survey, Hybrid Prime Camp Survey, um, and other overlapping galaxy surveys. So just to show you that we really are doing much better than Planck, this is a preliminary plot of the noise power spectra of these maps. So the Planck Y map noise power spectra are shown here in orange. The dashed and solid curves just correspond to uh, different ways of doing the component separation but you can compare dash to dash or solid to solid. Uh, and then our ACT plus Planck map is here in blue. So you can see that uh, at multiples of around 1,000, so around 10 arc minutes, the Planck noise is blowing up, whereas our noise uh, you know, stays pretty flat. In fact, you wouldn't really see it start to blow up until something like LF5000 or maybe higher. So this is, um, I think, pretty fantastic. There's no units here, by the way, because it's preliminary. So uh, don't try to take a picture, please, and uh, publish a forecast. Um, I want to mention that the same pipeline also lets us produce clean CMB maps uh, for lensing reconstruction uh, and other studies, um, and I'll mention uh, some of those applications a little bit later. All right, so what are the types of scientific analyses we want to do with these data products? Um, first, let me talk about cross-correlations um, of thermal SZ with, uh, with galaxy surveys. Um, so this was um, a project that was led by Johnny Greco, a PhD student at Princeton, who I co-supervised a few years ago, where we looked at the stacked signal in the Planck TSD maps on these locally brightest galaxies selected from Sloan. These are pretty low redshift galaxies um, that we're selecting to basically enforce them to be the most, uh, the brightest object in their nearby surroundings to suppress contamination from, uh, from neighbors. And the surprising result of this study, which was consistent with uh, a previous Planck analysis, was that a self-similar relation Oh, as one would predict in a universe with no feedback processes, was consistent with the data. So here I'm showing Y versus stellar mass, but if you do, we did this forward model uh, from halo mass to stellar mass uh, to infer this relation, we found that it was consistent with this uh, simple self-similar prediction down to halo masses almost as low as the Milky Way. 
So I think many of us thought that this was puzzling um, and doesn't seem plausible. So there was a, a number of things that had to be taken into account that were kind of uh, missed in the first Planck paper. One of them is that the angular resolution of Planck, as I mentioned, is something like five to 10 arc minutes. So you're really not probing the inner regions of the halos. You're really seeing this sort of bulk integrated single. The other effect that um, I looked into a couple of years ago uh, with a group of colleagues at Penn was to look for the so-called two halo term that contributes to this signal as well. So this is a re-measurement that we did of a somewhat different sample of halos, a uh, sample of galaxy groups selected from Sloan, again cross-correlated with the Planck Y-maps. And now you're seeing the cross-correlation function as a function of the halo mass. So the low mass is up here on the left, and high mass is down here on the bottom right. So for the most massive objects, this bin is you know, massive galaxy clusters. The one halo term, which is the long dash curve, really dominates the signal. And that's what you think you're looking at when you do a stacking analysis. However, as you go to lower masses, there's a signal that comes from the two halo term due to correlated uh, emission, sorry, emission from correlated structures. Um, and that sort of takes over and starts to dominate uh, for, for masses around 10 to the 13 solar masses. And at lower masses, it totally dominates the signal. So this led to a significant revision of our picture of the YM relation. Um, and this shows what we inferred uh, through a forward model of these data. So this is the YM relation. And then this is uh, what you get after you divide out by this self-similar prediction. Um, and our revised inference, which is these uh, shaded regions in the plots here, is consistent with simulations that invoke relatively strong levels of AGM feedback. So uh, this turned out to be an important revision of the story. Um, I would say that the key limitation uh, of all this work, really, is the coarse angular resolution of Planck. Um, this is about as far as we can push the Planck data. So to obtain large improvements, which we expect to do, we really need this ACT uh, plus Planck joint TSZ map, um, and followed by SO, uh, in order to really get inside the real radius of the halos um, and see what's going on here. OK, so that's um, sort of where things stand with thermal SZ. Now let me turn to the kinematic SZ signal. So um, extracting the KSZ signal requires some uh, statistical uh, wizardry because it preserves the black body spectrum of the CMB. But with various types of cross correlations, you can extract it. Um, there's one type of cross correlation that requires spectroscopic galaxy data. Um, and that's what I'm going to show you an example of here. And there's a second type, which you can do with photometric data, uh, which I've worked on a lot. And I'll show you some forecasts for that in a second. Uh, OK, so we inferred uh, the stack to gas density profile um, of BOSS CMAS galaxies from a cross correlation of ACT data with BOSS a couple of years ago. Uh, so what I'm showing you here is the cumulative electron density profile of these halos as a function of the uh, halocentric radius. So the real radius is here. Um, and then if you want the distance in megaparsecs, is up here on the top axis. Uh, so these are about redshift 0.6, the halo masses are sort of massive galaxy to low mass group scale. And I think what's pretty amazing here is that even with this detection, which was only a few sigma, you can see that there's a strong discrepancy between the data points and the predictions of the NFW profile, which we know that the dark matter follows. So basically, we know now that the gas does not follow the NFW profile, um, even in the outskirts, where certainly there's no x-ray constraints um, on the behavior of the gas for these types of halos in this regime. Um, I'm also showing a theoretical prediction from these AGN feedback simulations uh, that Nick ran a few years ago, which showed you the Compton Y maps from earlier. And you can see that, indeed, the data points are, are qualitatively consistent um, with that prediction. So I know this is pretty cool. I'll show you, show you some forecasts um, in just a minute uh, for how well we can do on these types of measurements uh, with SO, uh, which will be um, factors of 10 or 100 better. Um, Turning instead to a different type of KSE estimator. Uh, so this was one based on having spectroscopic data in your galaxy survey. Uh, these forecasts now are for a different estimator that I talked about in some detail here last year, so I'm not going into uh, right now. Uh, this so-called projected field estimator can be uh, applied to data sets that only have photometric redshifts, or actually no redshift data at all. Uh, we used this last year, well, a few years ago now, uh, uh, in combination with Planck data applied to the WISE galaxy survey. Uh, to detect the KSE signal um, at roughly four sigma significance, um, the highest detection significance, in fact, still to date. Uh, what we're, what's really exciting about this estimator is that with high resolution data sets like ACT and SO, the signal to noise just really shoots up. So I expect that applying this 
um, to the uh, joint act plus Planck maps that we're making now, we can probably get somewhere around 50 sigma uh, detection significance, and then pushing this uh, to larger sky areas in the coming years will yield uh, really just immense signal to noise. All right, so let me show you some of these explicit forecasts that I've been doing uh, for the Simons Observatory. This is a pretty detailed analysis. I'm going to elide most of those details for now, uh, but we're including a full battery of foregrounds, multi-frequency component separation. I want to emphasize that this is really enabled by the multi-frequency component separation. Uh, and we're extracting the predictions for these signals directly from cosmological hydrodynamics simulations, uh, which I think is one of the first times that people have really tried to do this across a range of simulations. So here's uh, a first example. This is what the projected gas density and gas pressure profiles look like um, for a stack of 250,000 luminous red galaxies at a redshift around 0.2, so a low redshift bin. Uh, these are you know, halo masses around 10 to the 13 solar masses. And I'm showing you um, uh, predictions from all these different hydro simulations. So Bahamas, the Eagle simulation, illustrious TNG, as well as the Nix uh, simulation. Um, and one can see some of the interesting effects of the different feedback prescriptions just by eye in these plots. So for example, if you look at these three Bahamas curves, these basically just tune the amount of AGN feedback that's introduced into the simulation. So the orange has the most and the green has the least. And as you crank up the amount of AGN feedback, you just push the gas out of the halo. So in this measurement here of the gas density profile, you can just see that the gas is pushed to larger radii. How yeah. come the error bars are larger farther out? Don't you have more surface area and more? Yeah, know? so for the KSZ, it's just for it, because they get confused uh, with CMD fluctuations on large scales. Um, and then for the thermal SZ, uh, I mean, you're, you're just running out of, you know, uh, it's basically just the shot noise, right? Kicking. Okay, and then you can get all the way into the point two. So, like, one megaparsec would be about an arc minute or so. So, how do you? <coughs> So it's like 1.5 arc meters, right? So how do you have all those points all the way in to? Yeah, so I should mention that the yeah these are not uh, in, these are not specifically independent bins. So the error bars here are correlated pretty strongly. Uh, these have all been convolved with the 1.5 arc minute beam. Uh, to look at this, yeah, the total signal to noise of both of these coincidentally is about 20. Um, so if you did a chi by I here, you would think it was more than 20, uh, but because they're so correlated, it's about 20. Um, yeah, so I think this is pretty exciting. Uh, one can basically see you know, by eye that we're going to distinguish between these predictions at high significance. Um, so this is what it looks like at, at low red shifts. Let me show you an example now at higher red shifts. This is a similar sample of LRGs at red shift 1. Of course, there's going to be galaxies across the entire red shift range here from you know, 0.1 out to red shift 2, even with LSST. Um, so now the viral radius is, of course, um, we're resolving things sort of at the viral radius scale, but not that well within the viral radius. Uh, but nevertheless, we can measure the profiles here, again, at high significance, in just this narrow mass and redshift bin. Again, the significance is about 20 for both of these. So the total signal to noise of all the KSZ and TSZ measurements with the survey will be well into the hundreds or even thousands. Um, so at that point, you might as well break it down really into these individual small bins. Um, the predictions of the different profiles are even more different in these high redshift bins. Uh, I think that's not surprising given our knowledge of these feedback processes. Um, so I would argue that this is really the frontier uh, for, for making these types of, uh, of constraints. And I think that this is the regime where we can really do this with SZ um, and the X-rays are, are really losing signal to noise out there. All right, so I'm pretty excited about all of that. But in case you're more interested in cosmology than galaxy formation, I do want to make one final point here, which is that uh, this is also highly relevant to cosmological uh, constraints with upcoming surveys, and that's through the impact of baryons on the small scale matter power spectrum. So this is, uh, effects have been known to be quite dramatic, uh, but still remain pretty poorly constrained uh, for the reasons that I just showed you earlier with these simulations. So here what we're seeing is the ratio of the matter power spectrum in a hydro sim with the full physics turned on, this is from illustrious TNG, uh, compared to the dark matter only prediction, and these bands indicate a 1% change or a 10% change, and you can see that for these different simulations, you're getting up to 10% level changes over the range of scales that are being planned to be used for weak lensing cosmology with LSST. So that's obviously an issue. Um, it's been shown by a number of studies that this produces a many sigma bias in cosmological parameters if it's not accounted for. And I'm not aware of uh, a robust way to solve this internally within the weak lensing field. So uh, a number of us are working right now on a demonstration of how this issue can be overcome 
uh, with a combination of uh, KZ and TZ data. So stay tuned for that. Okay, in the last part of the talk here, I want to turn to talking about cosmology, in particular probing neutrino masses uh, with CMB lensing. I'm going to focus on lensing, but I do want to note that uh, uh, the thermal Z signal is also a pretty robust probe of neutrino masses as well. So CMB lensing is not just a theoretically predicted signal. We've actually measured this. So the first detection was made with ACT several years ago now. Um, this was the first map that was produced. Um, and this is a cartoon. <laughs> this is not obviously real data, but this is. This is just meant to emphasize that what you're seeing with CMB lensing is this projection of the cosmic web of structure uh, onto this 2D plane weighted by the lensing kernel that I showed you earlier. So the bright regions here correspond to matter over densities, and the dark regions correspond to matter under densities. So this has been measured at higher signal, uh, signals and noise over the full sky by Planck. Um, this is their state-of-the-art map from um, 2016. Uh, so this is a map of all the matter in the universe, modular this lensing kernel, um, and the fact that it you know, stops at redshift 1100, although that's pretty much the whole universe. Um, and again, here you're seeing uh, these large-scale over-densities uh, and large-scale under-densities. So I think that this is um, very cool. How do we actually statistically extract information from these maps? Uh, they're close to Gaussian random fields, particularly on large scales. So we characterize lensing maps with their power spectrum. So that just basically says how much lensing fluctuation power is there as a function of angular scale. So uh, multipole of around 200 is a scale of around a degree. Multipoles around L of 1,000 correspond to smaller scales around 10 arc minutes, uh, and so on. And this is what the theor theoretically predicted lensing power spectrum looks like. So here's a compilation of the current status of the field. Uh, so Planck has measured this at 40 sigma, corresponding to a 2.5% precision measurement, which is uh, very impressive. That's the purple error boxes shown here. And then there's a compilation of other measurements uh, that are shown in these other uh, colored boxes. So the most recent ACT measurements, which are three years old now, are in orange. And I'll show you a forecast for how well we expect to do with the current ACT data in just a second. All right, so what are some of the physics that we're trying to learn from these measurements? Obviously, measuring the power spectrum itself is, is very neat. Probes things like the amplitude of fluctuations. But what are the fundamental physics that we want to infer? Uh, the one that I'm most immediately excited about uh, is related to the uh, physics responsible for uh, non-zero neutrino masses. So a brief review uh, for those um, unfamiliar. We've, been, we've known for, I think, over 15 or 20 years now that uh, neutrinos do have non-zero mass because we've observed the oscillations between their flavor eigenstates. So in particular, uh, we've constrained the squared mass differences between the three species at high precision from solar neutrino oscillations and atmospheric neutrino oscillations. Uh, this still leaves two possibilities for the hierarchy or the ordering of the masses. So we could have the so-called normal hierarchy with two light neutrinos and one massive neutrino, and an inverted hierarchy with one light neutrino uh, and two more massive neutrinos. Um, and given our knowledge of the square mass differences, you can show with some algebra that there's two possibilities then for the minimum summed total mass of the three species. In the normal hierarchy, it's about 60 milli electron volts. In the inverted hierarchy, it's about 100 milli electron volts. So this gives you a lower bound that you can then say is a guaranteed signal to go after with cosmological measurements. So why is this relevant to cosmology? The basic idea is that uh, thermal, thermal neutrinos that are produced thermally in the early universe are moving at high velocities. Um, and this affects how a cosmic structure goes. Basically, these fast-moving neutrinos uh, do not cluster gravitationally very effectively. So this is a picture extracted from two different simulations, one that's run with massive neutrinos and one without massive neutrinos. Uh, and what you want to see, basically, is that the structure is much more, um, there's much higher contrast in the structures on the right than on the left. On the left, things are kind of smeared out. And on the right, you have these very peaked dark red regions with these very deep, empty blue regions between them. How massive are those neutrinos on the left? Uh, these are definitely rolled out. I think they're like one or two electron volts. Okay. Yeah. But uh, as a qualitative picture, I think it's useful. All right, so how does this translate to the observables? Basically, this suppresses the lensing power spectrum. There's much less uh, fluctuation power in this map than there is in this map. <coughs> so by eye, you, you can't see this effect uh, too easily. But if you look at the relative difference in these cosmologies with massive neutrinos to cosmologies with massless neutrinos, it produces something like a few percent level suppression for the level of uh, neutrino masses that we're interested in here. So the uh, current constraint from Planck um, is that the sum of the three uh, 
neutrino species has a mass less than 120 milli electron volts. And I'll show you the forecast for upcoming experiments uh, in just a second, which are getting down to basically the minimum allowed mass uh, that I discussed a second ago. So for ACT, uh, this is a forecast for how well we expect to do essentially with the data on hand. Uh, we think we'll basically catch up to Planck with the data that's on hand and uh, surpass them within the next year or two. Uh, translated into a neutrino mass constraint, uh, this corresponds to uh, one sigma error of about 80 milli electron volts. So we're getting close to that lower limit that I mentioned uh, a minute ago. For Simon's Observatory, we expect to do better still. So this is a forecast for the lensing power spectrum measured with SO for two levels of sensitivity. The baseline sensitivity is what we very much expect we will achieve. It's guaranteed, essentially. The goal is what we hope to achieve. Um, I should note that the noise um, in these forecasts, as in all the other forecasts in our paper, includes foreground uh, component separation uh, that was led by, by me. So uh, translated into a neutrino mass constraint, this uh, gives you one sigma error on the order of 30 or 40 milli electron volts, um, which is just about good enough to guarantee a detection. The thing that starts to limit us at this level of sensitivity is no longer our measurement of lensing, but in fact our measurement of some of the other cosmological parameters, um, in particular tau, the optical depth to reionization. And we've been thinking about ways to get around that uh, recently, so please ask me afterwards if you're interested. So I want to close uh, by discussing some of the challenges. I'll show you these fantastic numbers, and you might think, well, these things just come for free. But in fact, there's a huge amount of work that has to be done to achieve that level of precision. I want to focus in particular um, on foregrounds and multi-frequency component separation. Um, so this quadratic estimator that I showed you earlier, uh, while it's ideally most sensitive to lensing, it is uh, susceptible to biases that come in from other non-Gaussian signals in the microwave sky. So thermal SZ, for example, can contribute to this um, in a way that introduces a bias. Um, a number of us have been looking at these biases for the last few years. In principle, you can remove uh, all of the ones that do not uh, preserve the black body spectrum of the CMB. Um, so you could use multi-frequency information with some of those methods that I showed you earlier uh, to remove those biases. One exception is the kinematic SZ signal. So last year, Simone Ferraro and I uh, looked into this bias for the first time. I'm just going to show you the bias to cross correlations of the kappa field with other large scale structure tracers. But we found that it was non, non negligible for upcoming surveys. So this is the fractional bias for the cross correlation of CMB lensing map with a, a galaxy survey like uh, LSST um, for three different generations of surveys. So the Planck data here, so Planck is mostly safe from this particular KSZ bias. Um, then stage 3 CMB experiment, like something like advanced ACT into SO, and then uh, CMB stage 4 experiment down here. And you can see that this is a large fractional bias on the order of uh, 10 to 15 percent. Um, this will lead to a non-negligible bias on your neutrino mass inference, so tools have to be developed to mitigate these types of, of biases. Um, I actually think that there might be hints of these biases in current measurements already. So the KSZ bias is pretty small, but a similar bias arises from thermal SZ that's much larger. Um, and there have been these uh, puzzling uh, deficits in cross correlations of Planck CMB lensing map uh, with other galaxy, with galaxy surveys um, on large scales. Um, I think Shirley was involved in this particular measurement. We've seen it in some other ones as well, where the theory curves tend to overpredict uh, the data on large angular scales, and qualitatively it has the same shape as these types of biases. Uh, fortunately, uh, I think that there's cause for optimism um, for this particular challenge. So Matt Montevatrel and I last year developed a new estimator for CMB lensing um, in which we showed that you don't have to necessarily clean out all of the foregrounds that go into this quadratic estimator. But instead, you only have to clean uh, the foregrounds out of one of these legs, which means that the signal to noise penalty that you pay when you do that foreground cleaning is much less than you would have thought. So we've dem demonstrated this on simulations here. So I'm showing you, again, a fractional bias to a cross correlation with galaxy surveys where if you don't do anything, this thermal SZ bias is large. If you just clean the gradient leg of this estimator, you basically remove the entire bias. So we're actually applying this now to data using this tile C uh, code that I mentioned earlier to make these clean CMB maps. Uh, and these are going directly into the ACT uh, lensing reconstruction pipeline right now. All right, so uh, just to wrap up, I want to emphasize how excited I am really about the whole range of science that SO is going to do. Um, I didn't have time to talk about the early universe too much today. Uh, but please ask me if you're interested, um, particularly in uh, foreground cleaning aspects uh, for primordial B modes. Um, 
I want to emphasize that I am very, partic uh, very much interested um, in the growth of structure constraints that we get from lensing, as well as constraints on galaxy formation and evolution uh, from the SE signals, which I think are really going to probe a totally uh, uncharted uh, range of observational parameter space. So I'll leave you with these three questions and these three uh, probes, um, and I'm happy to um, take any questions that you have. Thanks.